good evening and welcome to Perkins Center for the Arts, The Butterfly. This evening, we have five phenomenal tellers who are going to share with us what dreams are made of. I would like to introduce the tellers. We have Kapila Nepal. Can you wave, Kapila? Yes. And Vanoa Lego. Gwen Napier. Ian Hanley. And Marguerite Ferrer. The butterfly was created to be a live, interactive, communal storytelling activity. Anyone can tell at the butterfly. We just ask that you come and you, you register and apply to tell for the particular theme. So this evening, again, we have dreams. And the way the butterfly came about, it was from the thinking about a dream of a man. His name was Dr. Hugh Morgan. And we call him Brother Blue. Now, Brother Blue, I met him when I was at Harvard University. He was at Harvard University. I was at Northeastern. I worked at Harvard later. But I met him at Northeastern University. When he came, he had butterflies on his hands. And he was talking about transformations. And Brother Blue had to be one of the deepest men on the planet. He's an ancestor now, and still he inspires. And so this evening, we hope that you hear transformational stories, some stories that will make you laugh, but certainly stories that will make you feel and make us feel connected. You can watch here on Zoom, but you can also watch us on Facebook. We have in the chat a link to our Facebook page in case anybody on Zoom would like to invite people to join us on Facebook. And so we are going to begin our storytelling this evening with the phenomenal, phenomenal executive director of the National Association of Black Storytellers. We have spot lit our Vanor Lego. And let me tell you about Vanor. This Vanor Lego, she's been a past president. She works, I can't tell you how hard for this, for the National Association of Black Storytellers. So please welcome. And she's a phenomenal, awesome, crack me up teller. And she can be a serious teller as well. Here we go, but no let go. Thank you, Queen. <laughs> this story is a personal story that happens to be true. I call it, when will you accept your gift? Now, I am the oldest of seven. We grew up in Scotlandville, Louisiana. Scotlandville was a rural village where there was the opening for steam trading of the slaves. It was also, it was also a cotton, cotton plantation. Scotlandville, at that time, in 1914, there was only one African-American family there. When Southern University A&M College was moved from New Orleans to the Mississippi Bluff, that is the time 
that we found out that there was only one black family there. But they grew to be the largest majority African-American town in the state of Louisiana. Now in Scotlandville, everybody knew everybody. There was nothing that would happen that you wouldn't know about. And if you were one of the children who did something that you weren't supposed to do, it would beat you home. And so you didn't want to get caught doing something you weren't supposed to. Also in that town, everybody had somebody in their family who could interpret dreams. Now for our family, that person was Aunt Verna. Aunt Verna lived in Port Hudson, Louisiana, which was about seven miles from Scotlandville. And Port Hudson had been a very famous place at one time. That was the place where they had the siege of Port Hudson. And it said that it was the largest, uh, longest military siege. It lasted 48 days. So the history says. But that's the place where most of my family lived. How is that? Well, my great-grandfather, whose name was Frank Stevenson, had 10 children. And each one of those 10 had 10. And each one of those 10 had almost 10. So you can see how soon and very soon you had a large community of kinfolk. Well, Aunt Verna was my grandfather's sister-in-law, and she could tell you all about your dreams. Well, in 1964, I had a dream, and the dream was that I could see something going on in the church. There was a casket, and there were people in the family that I could see. And Sandra Belton was standing singing in the choir and leading a song. And when I awakened, all of these things stayed with me. So I asked my mother, who was a beautician, Mom, did somebody die last night? And in her Anna way, she said, somebody dies every night. I said, no, did somebody in our family die? She said, no. I said, but I dreamed. She said, yay, too much. No, I did somebody, and so I, then I shared the dream with her, and she said, well, call Aunt Verna and tell her your dream. I called Aunt Verna, and Aunt Verna said, just pray and watch your dream. When I got off the phone, my mother wanted to know, well, what did Aunt Verna say? I said, Aunt Verna said, just pray and watch your dream. She said, what else did she say? Well, that's all she said. So I'm in school, it's summertime, I'm not living on a campus, and I go on off to my class. I get back home, it's about 12 o'clock in the day. My mother is not home. And so I ask my stepfather, well, where's Ma? He says, your mama went to Port Hudson, ain't gonna die. Of course, it affected me because in my ear, I am hearing a runner say, just pray and watch your dream. And why was that? Because why did I have to dream this? I found out later that both her daughters also had dreams that, that week, during that week. And Verna wasn't sick. She had had something about varicose veins, and she was just going for a checkup. And while she was going the way to the doctor, my cousin said she talked about how beautiful everything was. There was this beautiful sunshine, the clouds were beautiful, the grass, was, everything was beautiful. By the time they got to the doctor's office, Ingrana was dead. That stayed with me, of course, for a very long time, even till now. Fast forward, I'm now living in New Orleans and I have two children who sometimes go to Port Hudson to visit my mother in Scotlandville, who texts them to Port Hudson to visit their relatives. I have a dream, and that dream is that there is a fire not far from Aunt Verna's house, and someone is killed in that fire. 
I called my mother and said, don't let my children go to Aunt Lillian's house because Aunt Lillian lived across the road from Aunt Vernon. But she had a pond in the back of our house. And it is said that if you dreamed about fire, that it was water. Two days later, my mother called me and said, no, it was not water. It was fire. There was a fire not far from Aunt Vernon's house in which someone was killed. <sighs> These types of things continued on different times at different times about what's going to happen. Well, fast forward. I'm now a storyteller and I am on my way to Yanceyville, North Carolina. I am so excited I don't know what to do because this is my first storytellers retreat. Now, I got there early because I wanted to see everything. So while I watched and everything and looked and everything, I'm going to all the rooms in the building and there's a meeting going on. I stick my head in because I'm nosy. They invite me in. I go in and they say, come on in. When I sit down, they were discussing gifts. I started to feel very uncomfortable. And as I attempted to leave, they said, oh, no, don't leave. Come on, stay on in. We're about to have prayer. Prayer? Okay. So I got in the circle with them, and they are beginning to pray. Now, I can't tell you what happened, because I, I don't know what happened. All I know for sure is that there's something was going on in that circle. Seemed like electricity or something was on. I don't know what happened. I can't tell you exactly what happened. But what I know is when I came to myself, they asked me about my experiences. And I shared with them about my dreams that I've had. And they said, oh, you are a dreamer. To which I said, no, I'm not. They said, oh, yes, you are a dreamer. I said, I'm not a dreamer. They said, you should not deny your dream, your, your guilt. I said, no, it is not. Well, I shared it with Baba Jamal. And Baba Jamal says, well, Lenore, you know, you can't deny something you have. It's nothing you can do about it. Just accept it. And I said, yeah, right. Well, several things have happened over the years. Similar to that, I have no explanation for it. But this I do know. My children will tell you that there have been times when things happen, and I make a statement. The statement is always on it, on the dot, and correct. It's not with me all the time. It's not 24-7. But when it is, I'm on cue. So then I ask you, is it a gift? Or is it something else? And will I ever accept it as a gift? My story of dreams. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, that was a wonderful story, and I've witnessed your gift, and I've witnessed your denial of the gift. Um, particularly, I remember when we were in Ghana together, and you told that story when there was when there was no electricity in the dark, and there were so many things manifesting from your gift in that moment. And um, you have a gift, I've seen it many times. So um, personally, I honor you for that. And I thank you this evening for sharing that gift. You can put comments about the Norse story um, at, at, right in our box, in the chat box. And if you're on Facebook, you can also write comments and Jacinia, will let us know. We'll come back to Jacinia and she'll let us know. Ha, Paul Best says, Mama Venora is a gift, period. 
<laughs> and there's no lie from that. Yes, she sure is a gift for sure, says her daughter, Tanisha. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Um, so we want to thank you again, Venora, and we hope that you keep sharing your gift, your blessing in it. One and only Charlotte. Love you, Ma, <laughs> uh, says Tanisha. And um, one and only my mother, Charlotte says. One and only my mother. All right, and you can keep posting and we'll come back and check, check that out. And next we're going to go to our next teller. We're going to spotlight our next teller. We're going to come up with Ian Henley. And I met Ian uh, when he, we were live at a butterfly in Collingswood, New Jersey. So uh, Ian has been telling for a long time, and he loves telling tales in communal settings. So welcome again, Ian. Thank you. The story I'm going to tell you tonight is an old folktale. Perhaps it is true, perhaps it is not. Believe as you will. But I believe that long ago, long, long ago, don't ask so long, but it was long ago, there was a time when animals could speak like you and me. And it just so happened at this time that this boar and this antelope were great friends. And every day they would meet in the meadow and play and they would run back and forth, particularly on nice, warm, sunny days. They would have the best time playing. And one day, the antelope was there, and he was wondering where his friend the boar was, because he was not there yet. But he figured he was just running late, and so he was running back and forth and having the greatest time when who should come up walking very slowly, looking very sad, but the boar. Mm -hmm. What's wrong? What's wrong, my friend? Oh, I had a horrible dream last night. What did you dream? What did you dream? I dreamed I'm going to eat you. And as we know, all dreams must come true. No, nope. no, nope, they do not have to come true. You're not going to eat me. And so they began to argue, as friends will argue, going back and forth with the boar going, but dreams must come true, I have to eat you. And the antelope not liking that idea at all. Well, they couldn't decide who was right. And so they decided that they would go to the king of their land and let the king decide, for surely as king he must be wise, and he would know what to do. Now it just so happened that up in the tree, laughing as these two argued, was this ape, and he decided that he would follow along. And so he did from tree to tree, and tree to tree, and so was not seen by the boar or the antelope. And they came before the king, who since it was a warm and sunny and most pleasant day, was holding his court outside. And sure enough, all the people that had any questions could come before his majesty who would dispense his kingly wisdom. And so finally, the boar and the antelope, it was their turn. And so your majesty, you see, I dreamed I would eat him. And as we know, all dreams must come true. So I should eat him. No, that's ridiculous. He should not eat me. I don't want to be eaten. Well, the king thought about this for a second, and he said to himself, well, you know, all of my dreams, when I dream them, when I wake, if I wish them so, they are so. So since my dreams come true, why should yours not come true, good boar? So I'm afraid, good antelope, he's, he's going to eat you. Well, the antelope didn't like this at all and started looking like, time to run, when who should come jumping out of the tree, but, well, hopefully you remember, the ape, yes, my friends, the ape leaped down before the throne and went, Your Majesty, I dreamed last night that I should marry your daughter. And as it is, she was the fairest and most beautiful woman in all the land, as all king's daughters are. And Your Majesty, did you not? Just say that all dreams must come true, so bring her forth so that we might be wed. Now, the king didn't like this idea. And so he said, hold, let me think. This was new for him, being king, thinking. 
And he put his head between his hands and went, oh. And finally he said, a preposterous thing or a silly thing is silly whether you dream it or not and does not have to be so. And so you, good boar, do not have to eat your lifelong friend, the antelope. And you, ape, are not going to marry my daughter. I mean, seriously, you're an ape. It's not going to happen. Well, so it was that they were dismissed for the king had a headache for some reason, thinking perhaps again, hard for him. And the ape went home to his wife, who was very happy he did not have to marry the king's daughter, for she felt that one wife was enough for him, as I'm sure it would be for me and, and for any that are listening now. And the boar and the antelope, well, they play this very day, every day in the meadow, and are great friends. And the boar was very happy. He did not have to eat the antelope. But I think the antelope was even happier than he. <laughs> good day, good friends and gentles all. Thank you, thank you so much for that wonderful story. Where did you get that story from? I read that story, which I've embellished over the years, uh, from uh, a book I read years ago when I was a little kid, uh, uh, Tricky Tales. Mm, that is a tricky tale. I love that input about thinking, the king thinking as well. That was hilarious. Um, at this time, we're gonna have um, any tellers wanna comment? on uh or if any of the guests want to comment um on ian's story anybody have anything they want to say about ian's story or ask ian any questions any of the guests any of the storytellers or any comments you can make any comments as well Yesenia says that it is so funny. And Venora, I want to go back and say that uh, you had a couple more comments. And again, if you have comments about Ian's story out there in Zoom land or Facebook land, you can just post those and we'll get those. Uh, Paul Best said that was witty stories are always a win. That was what Paul Best says to Ian. And back to you, Venora, your um, Janice Curtis Green, president of the National Association of Black Storytellers, says, one, she's a witness. And two, that you look beautiful. Um, and Venora must have dreamed it. Ha, ha, ha. Right? Um, and your son says, where to go, mom, from your son, Sean. <laughs> All right. So uh, Kim Wynn, who is uh, the Folk Life, uh, she leads uh, the Folk Life, the Five Folk Life Centers in, of New Jersey. Uh, she's online, and she's saying it was very entertaining, your story, Ann. All right, so next we're going to go, we're going to take a trip a little bit further around the world. We had Ian from New Jersey. We had uh, Venor from New Orleans. But now we're going to spotlight Kapila Nakpal, who was in India. And it is around four o'clock in the morning in India, and she woke up at 2.30 in order to come and tell with us. She really began um, telling stories about five years ago in a collection uh, at her school of students, college students. And so she has an institute now where she tells to teens and children. We welcome Apila Nakpal. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Namaste from India. And my story about the dreams. Uh, first of all, I would like to say something. You know, life interjects, builds pile up. And sometimes we are too engrossed in our real world that we hardly pursue our dreams. And, uh, you know, we all follow our, we should follow our dreams because that makes our life worth living and you may become an inspiration to others. What I believe that we live only once, so it's very important to chase our dreams. So the story which I'm going to narrate, it's about a postman, and it's a real story. It belongs to a small village somewhere very far, somewhere near France, and it's called the Postman's Palace. Now you must be wondering that what, what can a postman do? Well, well, you will be amazed what this postman did. 
Now, well, all the stories, they begin with once upon a time, and yes, this also begins with once upon a time, there was a postman who had a dream. We all have dreams. We all have. So this postman also had a dream. His name was Ferdinand Chevel, and he lived in a hilly part of France uh, that was a little village miles from anywhere a long time ago before postmen had vans, even before postmen had bicycles. Now this man used to walk almost 35 kilometers with his big bag on his back, delivering letters. Well, Monsieur, this is a letter for you. A letter for you. A letter for you. And people always look, used to look forward to the postman because that was the only way of communication during those days. Good morning, Monsieur Shell, they used to say. The dream the postman had was a very special one. He dreamt that he built a palace in his back garden, a wonderful dream palace with towers and minarets and staircases and all kinds of strange creatures, all made out of stone. Now, the next day, postman remembered his dream and it discussed with his wife. We all do. The moment we see some dream, we, you know, when we feel strongly something about it, we try to discuss with our family members, but then on first day, we don't take it too seriously, yeah? So he also didn't take it too seriously and, you know, just he let it go. But something happened. One day, the postman was out with his big bag delivering letters when he tripped over a rock. It looked just like one of the strange animals he had seen on the top of the palace in his dream. He picked it up, put it in his bag, along with the letters. The next day, he saw another strange shaped stone and took it home. Then another, and another, and another. Now, he was piling up the stones. He was collecting the stones. All the villagers, they begin to wonder what the pile of stones was doing in the postman's garden. Hey, hey, hello. What is Master Shevel making? Any idea? They would say. Now, nobody had any clue about it. Soon, postman wanted to bring home bigger stones that were too big for his pockets. And poor Madame, Madame Shevel, his wife, she always complained that she had to mend his pockets every night because obviously the stones that he used to keep in his pocket used to tear off the pockets and again she had to stitch them again. So now he bought a wheelbarrow and went all the way round in the morning every evening filling it up with the exciting shaped stones. Now the villagers wondered what he was doing. Master Butcher said, who was a butcher? What is Master Shevel up to now? What is he doing now? Because when he was about to sleep, he saw a solitary figure pushing sack after sack of cement, struck the stones. The postman was just trying to, you know, put the stones together to build up the foundation. And they used to see and wonder, what is he doing all alone, all by himself? But Master Shevel was building the palace of his dream. The postman was very happy because he started chasing his dream. Some of the village children, they climbed up on the garden wall to see. What is Master Shell doing? Hey, 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 do you know? What is Master Shell doing? <laughs> it looks like fun to me. Look at those stones. <laughs> it looks like fun to me. Nobody understood. Soon, strange shapes could be seen above the top of the garden wall. 
the beginnings of towers like ancient castles, the beginnings of spires like ancient churches, strange figures and even stranger animals. Now there was a cake shop in the village, Madame Charlotte's cake shop, and all the village ladies used to gather in the evening. And they were having their cake nicely, and they were talking to each other with their mouths full of cake. Hey, what do you know? What is Marshall Shell doing? I don't know what is it doing. Leave it, let's have our pastry. And years passed, and the palace grew. The postman was out with his wheelbarrow, winter and summer, good weather and bad weather. Every day he just chased his dream without thinking what others are talking about. He was up and down ladders late into the night. The neighbors would tap their foreheads. Oh, what is he up to? What about his poor wife? Poor Madame Charles. And then one day, there it was, the palace was finished. 10,000 days, 93,000 hours, 33 years of labor. The postman wrote proudly at the bottom of a staircase, the work of a single man. He was very proud and had his photograph taken in front of it, along with his wheelbarrow. Of course, it was a wonderful palace with little corridors to walk through, staircases and turrets to climb, little hollow figures in them. He invited all the villagers in to see it. Hmm, now we see what have you been doing all this time, Ferdinand. What a fine palace it is. On 14th July, that is France National Day and his only day's holiday, Monsieur and Madame Cheryl, they held a party and invited everyone. Monsieur Butcher, he cooked strings of little sausages. Madame Charlotte, she brought a, brought a cake to a ship like a wheelbarrow and written 33 on it because it took 33 years to complete that palace. And they had a nice dance and party together. They enjoyed and they felt happy. The children climbed up and down the towers, drank lots of lemonade and stayed up late. Gave each other rides in the wheelbarrow. They were just having fun. At the end of the party, they all sang the national anthem and made their way home singing all the time. And maybe you can join me a little bit. We can sing for this wonderful person. Ferdinand Shovel, Ferdinand Shovel, the hard work king. Ferdinand Shovel, Ferdinand Shovel, Ferdinand Shovel, the hard work king. Ferdinand Shovel, Ferdinand Shovel, hard work king. Ferdinand Shovel. And everybody praised this couple. What a lovely couple. What a splendid palace. What a marvelous time we had. Good old Master Cheryl. All because this postman remembered his dream. If you dream hard enough, you can make it come true, just like this postman. The real palace was built between 1879 and 1912. It's uh, somewhere, it's, an, it's now a national monument, just, just like I read. It's in Rome in France. So we should chase our dreams, just like Ferdinand and Cheryl. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful story, historic and true. Wow, that was great. And so we've heard so far that dreams can be gifts. And we heard that all dreams don't have to come true. <laughs> and now we've heard the impact and the worth and the value of chasing your dream one stone at a time. Wow. And of course, 
And I knew somebody was going to come up with that 33, talking about that 33. And Journey, Janice Curtis Green says, 33 years, the same number of years Jesus Christ lived. Love it. So positive. Jane uh, or Candy Lippincott, who's been a previous teller on The Butterfly, says, thank you. A hopeful dream, a reason to keep dreaming. Paul Best says, my dad is retired postman. I need to call him about our palace. Yes. We want to thank you again. What if this is a this is a premier storyteller from India, and I know that you'll be back with us in the future uh, because Capella has signed up for more telling, and we are excited. All right, and so now we're going to go to our next teller. We are going to spotlight Marguerite Feta, and I met Marguerite in. Camden when she was a teacher many years ago. And as she said earlier, uh, when I was teaching at um, Rutgers Artist Institute during the summer, I didn't know you took three years of classes with me for storytelling. So I'm so excited. And I'm always following her on Facebook. You see all those beautiful pictures behind her? That's her granddaughter. But right now, we are excited to hear your story. And you are in the spotlight. Hello, everybody. I have a story that's close to home. It's a South Jersey story. I was a nosy little girl, and I sat at my Nana's kitchen table in North Camden, and I was very, very quiet, so quiet, because then my Nana and my Aunt Vera and my mother would forget I was there and then we talk about the good stuff that they usually didn't talk about in front of kids. And one day my aunt reached into her purse and she fiddled around and she pulled out a little pamphlet. It was, it was about the size of a big uh, file card and it said, dreams, lucky numbers. And she paged through it slowly and she found something she showed it to my grandmother she showed it to my mother and then she put it back in her purse uh they weren't going to tell me what it was about my brother was at my grandmother's he was in the living room petting the dogs and since they weren't sharing what it was with me, I wish that I had been in the living room petting the dogs. There were no iPads in those days for children visiting their grandparents. So on the walk home, because we lived close to my grandmother who lived near the Ben Franklin Bridge, I said, mom, what was that book? What's a dream book? And she had a look on her face like, I guess I'll tell her. Well, it's a book that you look up a word and then you get a number. For example, you dream about the seashore. So you look up the word seashore, and then there's a number like 298. Then you play the numbers. And I was seven, so I, I didn't really get it. But she said, well, sometimes a man or a woman walks around the houses in our neighborhoods and he asks if you want to play the numbers. So that means you tell him the numbers that will be lucky for you, the ones that you found in the dream book. For example, the seashore, 298. And then maybe you'll win money. I, I didn't really understand how you could win money from that, but she didn't go into the mechanics. But I thought I would like to do it, and I was smiling. I was, I was kind of a serious little girl, but I must look really happy. So my mother looked worried and she said, hmm, well, it's illegal. And so that was the end of that. I had even been surprised that she had told me about that because my family prided themselves on doing what was right and not doing anything illegal. But then my mother cocked her head and she must have been remembering her, 
her childhood in North Camden. Well, she said, to tell you the truth, I think my grandmother had a dream book too. All the ladies on our street would pay money to try to win. And sometimes my grandmother even won. My brother looked up, he was younger than me. And then she really got quiet. She, she wasn't going to talk about playing the numbers anymore. Now let's leap ahead to 2020. I did look up on the internet about dream books. And here you can still buy dream books and apparently people still play the numbers even though you could, you could uh, play the lottery. Okay, get back to 1957. I think of the worst, most vivid dream I've ever had. It has stuck with me my whole life. It was based on a day trip that we took on an air condition, unair conditioned, no air conditioning, unair conditioned bus from the Camden bus terminal to Atlantic City bus terminal. So my aunt Vera, my mom, my brother and I were walking on the boardwalk. This was a big treat. And my mother and my aunt were even wearing lipstick. They were wearing ruffled dresses. They even had beach hats, although we didn't go on the beach. And they were laughing. They were so carefree and girlish. I could hardly recognize them. They just looked so happy to have a day out. My aunt was a factory worker at Crown Can in Philadelphia, and my mom was a housewife with a lot of chores to do, you know, in our little house in North Camden. So this was a big day for them. And it was a good day for my brother and for me. Uh, they, they weren't watching us really. They, they weren't saying things like, uh, don't ask for a donut. Don't ask us to buy anything, walk faster. Oh no, they were just happy as can be. And so my brother and I were just walking along and uh, just having a good time. I, I was watching everything because we didn't get to go places very much. And I noticed the big um, metal railing that prevented people from like falling onto the beach, you know, on the boardwalk. And also it could prevent you falling from the ocean because sometimes the water came up really deep and it was under the boardwalk. And that was a little scary, but I wasn't worried about it. And I knew I would never have to think about that again because we weren't going to go come back to Atlantic City for a long time. And we didn't because such a day was a treat. So weeks later, I was at home under a soft old sheet and my yellow chenille bedspread and I dreamed about that day trip and everything was the same. It was perfectly the same. My brother was there. We were like a little sunburned. We were on the boardwalk. We could smell the copper tone they had put all over us. It was my aunt Vera and my mother still happy and carefree. They weren't even paying attention to us. But all at once in the dream, the ocean breeze turned into a gigantic wind and blew me down on the boardwalk, but I didn't fall down exactly. My aunt and my mother kept talking and laughing. My brother didn't notice. Nobody saw that I fell and the wind kept pushing me. I rolled like a barrel, rolling down the boardwalk, down, 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 down. I was like a little girl barrel. The people sitting on the boardwalk benches watched me and didn't say a thing. The people on the tram watched me and they didn't say a thing. Nobody said, stop the tram, stop the tram. Watch out for that little kid, help her stop rowing. Nobody would help me stop rowing forever down the boardwalk. I was rowing and I could smell the cotton candy. I could smell the fudge shops. I could hear the people screaming on the boardwalk, but nobody did anything about it. I was screaming and screaming, but no sound came from my throat. Nobody would help me. 
Now the worst was about to happen in this dream. I was a kid afraid of the deep part of the ocean. The wind shoved me under the silver railing right off the boardwalk, down, 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 for like hundreds of miles between the boardwalk and the deepest part of the ocean. I fell through space for what seemed like forever, only a second before the wind dropped in me into the cold ocean depths. I woke up on the edge of my bed, almost falling to the floor. My heart leapt out of my throat and I crawled toward the middle of the bed and I pulled up that yellow, old yellow Chanel bedspread. Today, my heart thumps remembering that dream. But what I don't get is how can I, at 70 years of age, remember that dream of a seven-year-old girl? I can't even remember where I put my cell phone. How can I remember that dream book number 278? I'm thinking maybe perhaps I need to play the New Jersey lottery pick six, the pick three, I mean, number 298. But maybe really remembering that dream is good because I get a chance to remember my aunt and mother when they were still young and happy and alive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. You took me to so many memories. Um, and we heard so much folk life and uh, folklore around New Jersey. And those numbers, people started responding to the numbers right away. <laughs> um, Jacinia said, oh, my goodness, my Nana had a book like that. And uh, Jan Janice Curtis Green said, the numbers man, yay, bo, church ladies and their dream books. Um, everyone is going to play that number tomorrow, she says. <laughs> Your number tomorrow. Um, you brought up memories of the Peach Shake House in Indianapolis. Wow, wow. That's just interesting, Paul Best says, and he's out of Indianapolis. But I remember the boardwalk. And guess what? One of my favorite books when I was a kid, was Daddy Was a Number Runner. Anybody read that? Anybody, Venora, did you read that? Gwen, did you read that? Daddy Was a Number Runner. And guess what? My daddy was a number runner. <laughs> he was actually a number runner. Thank you for that. Um, Kim says, loved it. I am buying a lottery ticket. <laughs> she says, Kim, so you have everybody on that number. Thank you so much, Marguerite, for sharing your family and you and your dream and your, your uh, Jersey folk life. Thank you so, so much. So those are the comments we have. Jacinia, let, let us know. Just put it in the chat if we have any uh, comments from Facebook. Do any of the tellers want to say anything about uh, anybody that we did, didn't talk about yet today? You want to say anything to Venor? You want to say, say anything to Ian? You want to say anything to Marguerite? Any, any other tellers want to say anything? Capilla? You want to say anything to Capilla about the stories? Anybody? And I'm talking to the guests. You can unmute yourself if you want to share anything or if you relate it to any of the stories that you heard so far, our storytellers. All of the stories for Awesome Queen, I can relate to the number dream book. I won't tell you how, but that's a great memory, okay? <laughs> Yeah. So while you are muted, Gwen, you are up next, right? So our last teller this evening is the awesome and phenom phenomenal Gwen Napier. And we are coming out of Atlanta right now. She's also a member of the National Association of Black Storytellers. And she's one of our most precious adopted tellers when we go to, when we place at each festival that the National Association of Black Storytellers has, um, we place storytellers um, throughout that city in schools and libraries and community venues. And uh, Gwen is one of our uh, premier tellers in doing that program. And when Gwen is finished, well, I'm gonna make sure that Benor Legault tell us a little bit about that festival that will now be virtual. But for right now, we are down and ready to hear about what makes dreams with Gwen Napier. 
Thank you so much, Queen, and good evening to everyone out there in the storytelling world. My personal story today is going to be weaved into many world issues. There are many thoughts on dreams. Let me share one with you from Denzel Washington, the actor. He said, dreams are just dreams without goals, visions, and plans. Dreams are just simply dreams. Also, one from the singer John Lennon from the song Imagine. He says that you may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Maybe one day you'll join us and the world will be one. And lastly, the one that I love the best, from Bishop Dale Brunner from Atlanta, the world, the word of faith. He states that it is good to dream, but every now and then you have to wake up. And that will take me right into my story tonight. What about us, Mrs. Jones? What about us, Mrs. Jones? This story is very personal and very special to me because most of what has happened in this story, I had a chance to really hear this happen in a public school uh, in Atlanta. I could not confront the teacher, but I took my pen and my paper and I had to put this in print. It was the summer of 1972 when Ryan and his mother had moved from California. You see, they had moved to the rural area of Philadelphia, Mississippi. Now they moved there just to live and assist Ryan's grandfather who was ill. See, Ryan was a 12 year old young black man, but his mother was a nurse and his father was an officer in the military. As a matter of fact, he was in the Navy. Now, Ryan wanted to continue his education, so his mother, when they moved to Mississippi, she made sure that she enrolled Ryan in school. Now, the school was only about three or four blocks from where the grandfather lived. And the mother, she stopped by to check out the school to make sure that the school was going to be okay for Ryan. She couldn't help but notice that the school had more white or Caucasian children than African American children. But she said, mm, since Ryan has been involved in a diverse school in California, I think he's going to do okay. So she enrolled her son into this school. Ryan, the fifth grade student, was so excited about going to school that next morning. He woke up very early. He ate his breakfast. He prepared everything that he had to prepare. And his mother dropped him off at school that morning. Now his mother being a nurse, she knew that she had time to find herself a part-time nursing job and still take care of her husband's father and assist uh, her husband's mother. But she dropped Ryan off the school that morning and Ryan walked into the school and he couldn't help but notice the children. But he was pretty happy about taking time to attend the Mississippi Elementary School in Philadelphia, Mississippi. He went into his classroom and he looked around and he only saw one more young man, one more black boy that looked just like he did. He had no problem really adjusting to the other students. Ryan had a chance to really check out his teacher, Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones was an elderly, older 
Caucasian woman, and she looked like she was absolutely so mean and so cruel, but Ryan did not jump any conclusions. He sat at his desk right beside Samuel, who was the other black young man in that classroom. He and Samuel began to really establish a wonderful friendship. They talked about Philadelphia and they talked about their family. And Samuel even told Ryan that he had one sister, but his father was deceased and his father had been killed five years ago by a police officer who had mistakenly killed him for mistakenly identification chase. Ryan, in return, told Samuel about his family. He said, Samuel, my mother is a nurse and my father is an officer in the Navy. And we're just here for a short time because my grandfather is ill and once my grandfather is feeling better, we're going to go back home. All oh, the boys just really, really, they bonded so well together. And in school, in the fifth grade classroom with Ryan and Samuel, as Mrs. Jones began to really introduce her lesson to the students, Ryan was so enthused about raising his hand, making sure that Mrs. Jones saw him because he was really proficient in the areas of science, math, and social studies, and he really wanted to really answer the questions. But Mrs. Jones, for some reason, she would not, and she did not ever call on the black children. For some reason, Mrs. Jones always called only on the white students. Ryan asked Samuel, Samuel, does this happen all the time? You've been here for a while in this school. Does Mrs. Jones always ignore the black children and only call on the white students? Samuel said, yes, but I I've just learned to ignore it. But that was a problem for Ryan because Ryan was used to really being around a diverse group of children and people and he wasn't really used to being treated like Mrs. Jones was taking time to treat him. Now he didn't want to think in the back of his mind that Mrs. Jones was prejudiced. So he very soon and easily he erased that thought out of his mind. He went home and told his mother what had happened. She said, Ryan, go back to school as usual Give yeah, Mrs. Jones an opportunity. You, you're fairly new at that school. Maybe you're just imagining that this is happening. Well, Ryan went back to school the next day and all Mrs. Jones could talk about was a special event that was coming up in the next two or three weeks. It was Father's Day Out and In for students. And only dads could come to this program with their children. Oh, Mrs. Jones was so excited about this program. It's all she talked about. And the next day, Mrs. Jones, she came into the classroom and she had invitations. Now, Mrs. Jones had 26 students in her class, but she only had 24 invitations. Mrs. Jones, she passed out the invitations to every child in the classroom, but she did not give Ryan an invitation and she did not give one to Samuel. As Mrs. Jones walked away, Ryan raised his hand up and said, e -e excuse me, excuse me, Mrs. Jones, but what, what about us? Mrs. Jones, she came back and she looked in Ryan's face and she said, I know I did not give you boys an invitation. That's because I know that 
There are no black fathers. There are no black dads in your homes. And, and Ronnie was trying to explain, but Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones said, there are no black dads in the house of black people. So Ronnie went back home again and told his mother what Mrs. Jones had said. Ryan's mother once again said, Ryan, I know you're hurt. I know you're angry, but I need for you to go back to school and just do what you are asked to told. Believe me, it's going to work out. Now, Ryan did not know because his mom did not tell him that his father from the naval ship who was pending three months of retirement was on his way home. But she did not want to tell Ryan that. She wanted that to be a very, very special surprise. Ryan went back to school, did his work as usual, ignored Mrs. Jones all the way, went back home the next day. That was on a Wednesday. On a Friday, that is when they was going to have the special dance event program. Ryan's mom convinced him and Samuel go back to school while Ryan's mother and Samuel's mother came up with a plan. They had planned to surprise the boys on Friday after school. Oh, they went up to the school and they had a change of clothes for Ryan. They had a change of clothes for Samuel, and they were waiting at the school right by the gym. The boys were very surprised to see their moms. The mom said, boys, you're going to really attend the dance event. They went to the gym's door, and there was Mrs. Jones at the door, taking time to greet the parents, and she saw Ryan's mother and Samuel's mother, she said, I I'm sorry, uh, parents, but uh, this event is for dads and for their children only. You cannot come in. Now, Ryan's mom was really trying to really tell Mrs. Jones a word or two, but Mrs. Jones would not let Ryan's mother get anything out of her mouth. And then, right then, at the gym door, here comes. Stepping in was a very handsome African-American man dressed in his white military navy suit with balls all across his chest and had his hat tucked underneath his left arm. And he approached the door and told his wife, I will take it from here. He approached and he looked at Mrs. Jones. He said, you must be Mrs. Jones. I am Ryan's father. I am Officer Jackson. I am Officer Alexander Jackson. And I am Ryan's father. Ryan has a father and he was trying to tell you, just like my wife was trying to tell you, I do not live at home. I have been living on a ship as an officer for the last 25 years, serving my country with three years pending retirement. I am home now, and I am here for this program. Mrs. Jones tried to say something to Officer Alexander Jackson, but he took his son and he took Samuel, and they walked into the program, and they sat down together, and they had a wonderful time. They enjoyed the program, and they all went back home. Now, Officer Alexander's father began to feel better, and it was time for them to pack up and go back to California. But Officer Jackson, said, I can't go back before I do two more things. Number one, he went to the school board and he complained about Mrs. Jones. 
He got Mrs. Jones removed from the school system so that she would not ever say that there are not black fathers into black homes. And number two, he went and took time to establish and find an organization for Samuel, a big brother's organization. And then he went back home. He made sure that no other teacher would say there are no black fathers in the homes. When you dream, it's okay to dream, but you have to wake up. We have to really wake up against racism. Wake up those dreams against police brutality and wake up those dreams against any other crisis in the United States of America. It is time to wake up, America. It is time to wake up. Oh! <laughs> Wow, girl, you can unmute yourself, Anor, and you can go off. Tell us you can unmute yourselves. Gwen, that was profound. That was powerful. I have, that was moving. I'm crying. I am celebrating. Wow. Um, you know, we went from, you know, we, we've had personal dreams about your gift. And you know what? This tied from the top thing. It came right back around in terms of understanding who you are and the gifts that you are endowed with and not being oppressed by others, you know, but living your dream, you know, and living and waking up, waking up from uh, the dreams that everybody is now, you know, they're, they're talking about how we can be a better world and how we can stop racism and, you know, but wake up and see the truth first. You can't, you can't get better until you acknowledge the truth. Girl, you's a bad sister. Bad sister. Bad sister. <laughs> no, That's I'm wonderful. That was wonderful. Um, uh, Janice Curtis Green says, we are the American dream. Wow, says Sharon Holly. Gwen, thank you, all storytellers, that no one brought a nightmare. <laughs> she said she loved it. Um, deep exhale, Gwen. Sandra Bush says, um, thank you so much. Uh, Benora said to all the panelists, of course, and Benora, you can just talk right on out. And uh, somebody said, you're the bomb. Who said that? Somebody said, oh, you go, Gwendolyn. You are the bomb. That was Janice. And um, Candy Lippincott, again, who's been a, a teller uh, here as well. She uh, worked with Marguerite um, in the Camden schools. Um, I'm always seeing her post posting. She, you know, fighting against the and advocating against all the things that are happening uh, politically that are politically wrong, um, politically unjust. And she says yes. Candy who said. Uh, Paul Best says Lerone Bennett said a teacher is either a revolutionist or an oppressor. Yeah. How timely this story is as this shift in education is taking place. Yes. Right, and Yesenia is clapping. I can't thank you all enough for this full and rich evening of storytelling on dreams. We want to invite our audiences both on Facebook and on Zoom to join us. We have, if you save the chat, take those three dots and you save the chat, we do have the links to our webpage at Perkins Center for the Arts, where you can apply to be uh, a teller for our upcoming episodes. Our upcoming episodes is straight out of dot, dot, dot. That's in October. And in November, we have bad idea. The other thing that I'm going to ask you to do um, is please list on Facebook, list in Zoom, ideas that you have for themes because we're taking a break in December, but we're coming back for the full year of next year, and we're gonna put our themes up in October. So please suggest any themes, tellers, please suggest any themes, just chat, chat them right in the box. Um, we would appreciate that, or chat them on Facebook. Um, Kapila says, and Kapila, you can speak out. You can just speak out, it's okay. What were you, what did, what did you want to share? Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt, actually. I. The story of which Gwen narrated, it reminds me of Martin Luther King Jr. 
because I I narrate the story of Martin Luther King Jr. to my students too. Thank you so much for sharing that. I want to thank everybody, and let's see, there's another comment here. Okay. Uh, Jenny Marsh Marshine says, "What a wonderful story," and I think this dream is starting to edge towards reality now. So I want to thank everybody once again for coming this evening. I also want to let you know there's a link in the chat that links you to our website. We started a podcast, and it's called, this particular series is called Upon Our Authority. So look that up. Pretty soon I'll be interviewing Linda Goss for that. Jacenia says we have Facebook comments. So Jacenia, you want to come on and share those comments with us? Yes. Michelle Russo says, great story, Gwen. Judy Bateman says, so glad Mrs. Jones was set straight. Great story. (laughs) (laughs) And Nancy Gassell Mooney Freiling says, love your story, Gwen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Please follow us on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us online at www.perkinsarts.org. Once again, thank you so much, everybody. We want to say goodnight and we thank you.